All right, going to Todd Nettleton now from Voice of the Martyrs. We're talking about Iran. And uh, Todd, we want to get into the Christian persecution that's happening there, but let's start with uh, the coronavirus. And uh, if, if people remember in the early days of this outbreak, Iran was uh, reporting no numbers. Like they weren't getting anybody, even though Iraq and places right around them were. Uh, and then the truth started to come out. So, so what is the latest going on there uh, with how they responded to, to all of that? Well, it's interesting because I read a report just this morning about the early days of the coronavirus and the doctors in Iran were seeing it. They were worried. Uh, journalists were seeing people talking about it on social media, but they were afraid to report on it for fear of uh, upsetting the regime. And so the first acknowledgement of anyone in Iran having COVID-19 was when they announced that two people had died. Uh, up until that day, they they just denied, hey, no, no, but it hasn't come here. We don't have any cases uh, until they finally said, OK, two people have died. They actually were having flights back and forth to Wuhan, China uh, into February, long after the virus had been identified and where it had come from had been identified. So uh, the government really didn't take this seriously or, or simply just didn't want the people to know about it uh, for a long time. Yeah, and then there were reports, uh, I know the Washington Post and others had reports of uh, massive trenches and, and human burial grounds being dug. They were so big that they were visible from space. So I, I guess we'll probably not ever really know the number. But I think given how we've seen the pandemic play out around the world, we, it's safe to say, obviously, it's a lot higher than uh, what they're reporting. Um, but I want to shift gears and go talk about how Christians are faring there in Iran, obviously, you know, this Islamic state and, and, you know, apostasy is a big deal there and still is even uh, here in the 21st century. So um, tell me a little bit about uh, what life is like for Christians there and what's kind of the latest going on. Well, the good news is that the church in Iran is growing in incredibly rapidly. In fact, Operation World says uh, the fastest growing church in the world is in the Islamic Republic of Iran. And mm. One of the things that, that I love to talk about is, is how God uses uh, situations on earth to, to have his will come about. Uh, you know, we've talked before, I think, about the story of Joseph and what you intended for evil, God intended for good. If you go back to 1979 and the Islamic Revolution in Iran— I think a lot of people thought, you know, this is terrible for the church. This is, they're going to kill Christians. They're going to kick missionaries out. This is a bad thing for the church. What has happened, though, in the last 40 years is that the church has exploded inside Iran. Uh, and part of the credit for that goes to the Islamic government. In fact, I've had Iranian Christians tell me the greatest Christian missionary in the history of Iran is Ayatollah Khomeini, the leader of the Islamic Revolution. And you say, well, wait a minute, how could this Islamic revolutionary be the greatest Christian missionary? And they will tell you, the people of Iran have seen the true face of Islam. Their government says, we are doing everything according to the Quran. We're doing everything according to Islamic principles. And they've said that for the last 40 years. And yet today you have one of the highest drug addiction rates in the world. You have corruption, you have an economy that's in shambles. And the people look at that and say, wait a minute, if this is what 40 years of Islam has done, what are the other options? What else is out there? And so many Iranians would tell you, I'm not a Muslim, I'm an atheist. Many would tell you, I'm, I'm not a Muslim, I don't believe anything. But many, thousands, tens of thousands, have come to know Christ in the course of that uh, 40 years under Islamic rule. Have you heard, because we've reported on uh, Faithwire and CBN, a lot of these instances where uh, someone says that like Jesus will come to them in a vision or a dream. And, um, you know, and so those sorts of testimonies particularly ring powerful because of the situation that they're coming from uh, in an oppressive regime such as that. Have you heard similar stories and that, that sort of thing? I have heard some of those stories, too. Uh, one of my favorites, I, I met a lady named Afruz, who uh, was an Iranian Christian, is an Iranian Christian, and uh, she was a good Muslim. And in fact, she was trying to do everything she could to please Allah and to earn his favor. And yet uh, she just felt frustrated. She did not have peace in her life, and she felt frustrated. And, and finally, one night she said, listen, Allah, 
Uh, I'm going to stay up tonight until you show up and, and show yourself. And if you don't show yourself, then tomorrow I'm done. I'm not going to be a Muslim anymore. I'm not going to try to please you anymore. In the course of that night, she said, Jesus came and stood in the room with her. And she said her first thought was to run out of the room like this is this is weird. This is scary. What's going on? But then she thought, you know, I asked I asked all I asked God to show up. And now Jesus is here. I need to go in there. And the words that Jesus said to her in in that vision or dream or, or miraculous appearance were, come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Now, Afruz had never seen a Bible. She'd never read the Bible. She didn't know that those words are in the Bible. Uh, the next day or shortly after that, though, she was at work. She looked kind of upset, and one of her coworkers said, well, what's going on? What's going on with you? And she shared the story. Her coworker pulled out a Bible and opened to those words, come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Uh, and Afruz has been walking with Christ ever since. That is a fantastic story. And man, when you hear testimonies like that, it is it is hard not to be, I mean, what do you say to that if you're a skeptic or an atheist or something like that? I mean, there's really just nothing you can say. Uh, there's really no refuting it. Um, so tell me, uh, you know, Jesus uh, shows up and, and it's interesting because the Iranian culture, the Islamic culture already believes there is one God. So you don't have to convince them of that. But when Jesus shows up and says, Hey, I am God, I am the son of God. Uh, they are ready to follow him. Absolutely. And in, and in dire, uh, situation, you know, for Christians and, and especially for, for apostasy, you know, if any, anybody who is leaving, the Islamic faith, that is that is a big no-no uh, over in that neck of the woods. Um, why don't you tell me a little bit about this interview, Todd, that you guys had with Ibrahim Farouzi, if I'm pronouncing his name correctly. Uh, tell me a little bit about his story and what you guys uh, found there. Well, Ibrahim Farouzi is one of those who is an apostate. He left Islam. He's a follower of Jesus Christ. He was first arrested in 2010, and, and he ended up spending seven years in prison, uh, seven out of the last 10 years he's been in prison. When he finished up his prison sentence, though, instead of saying, Ibrahim, you know, you've served your time, you can go home, uh, the courts ruled that he would serve two more years of what they call internal exile. And so they sent him to a city along the border with Pakistan and said, hey, you have to stay in this city for two more years. You need to check in every week with the local police and let them know that you're here, let them know that you're following all the rules. Uh, and so Ibrahim is in internal exile, but he did a, a video interview with one of our partners, Hovsepian Ministries. Uh, we took the audio of that and aired it on Voice of the Martyrs Radio. Now, it's interesting because the week after we aired that, we learned that the police had come to visit Ibrahim, uh, not after we aired it, but after Hovsepian Ministries put it online and allowed people to see it and watch the video. Uh, and they basically said, Ibrahim, you should not have done that. You shouldn't be talking to outside groups. They added eight more months to his internal exile. Here's the thing that comes through, though, in his testimony. And as he shared, he has an amazing sense of peace. In fact, he talked about in the interview, listen, I, I made a great deal. I, I served six years in prison and I get to have eternity with Christ. So, so really I got, I got the much better end of that arrangement. That's the kind of faith that he has. And you can understand why that kind of faith is contagious. Uh, and other people want to, want to know more about what drives him and what allows him to go through that time in prison with such faithfulness. Amazing stuff. Um, so we hear now, as you're talking about that, that, that Christianity is growing rapidly uh, in Iran. We know uh, the government there doesn't want Christianity uh, in, in any way, shape, or form and do what they can to keep it down. So with the numbers growing, uh, you guys say that the government has sort of realized, well, we can't round all of them up. Uh, so what sort of tactic are they taking now to try to repress uh, this Christian sort of uprising that's happening in Iran right now? Well, what would typically happen right now is, you know, say a, a house meeting, a house Bible study or a house church meeting is raided by the police. They would uh, take pictures of everyone who's there. They would take down uh, identity, identity documents, take pictures of their, you know, driver's license or ID. 
the people though who would get arrested would be the people who were leading the meeting. And so they want to, like you say, they've kind of realized, I think we can't arrest everyone who's following Christ in Iran. There's just too many of them. So let's arrest the leaders. Let's arrest those who are giving out Bibles, who are sharing the gospel, who are encouraging more Muslims to become apostates by following Jesus Christ. So the leaders are often taken to jail. And, you know, they may or may not be put on trial. They may or may not go to court. But even if they're let go on bail, the charges are never dropped. And so what that means is, hey, if we catch you at another church meeting, not only will you be charged for that meeting, but we'll keep going with these charges as well. So many Christian leaders have actually had to flee the country under that kind of pressure. What often happens when bail is put up, they will take the deed to your house or the deed to your parents' house as your bail. And then they say, hey, if we find you at any more Christian meetings, we're going to take away your parents' house. They won't have a place to live anymore. So that's the kind of pressure they're putting. And again, the focus is on leaders and on those sharing the gospel rather than every single person who they catch at a Christian meeting. Yeah, and I don't think people here in America can have ever really fully comprehend um, what that means when you've got authorities. Like we we just assume probably in our minds, like picturing police showing up and things like that. But, um, you know, I saw firsthand when I went to Iraq in 2015 to report on one year after ISIS, uh, General Soleimani. He was, uh, you know, the head of these Shia militias. And, you know, I, I met a family who had been brutally tortured by this guy and his his militia men uh, when they want something and they want to intimidate people um, they have no qualms about how low they will go and how evil they will go I mean I saw a young boy who was tortured with a drill they had drilled a hole in his leg um, just to get the father to do whatever it was that they wanted him to do and he had burns all over his body his wife had actually been murdered some years before and they were in a um, IDP camp there in in Erbil in Iraq so uh, but that's Suleimani because he had control over multiple areas there. So um, so I, I don't know if people can fully grasp the types of uh, just the, the risks and the violence that, they, that the people there face. Let me give you an example. I, I had a conversation with a uh, house church leader inside Iran, working inside Iran, and he told me about how he and his wife have talked about if she gets arrested and if she's being sexually assaulted— by the guards or by those who are holding her captive. Uh, you know, if you think about, put yourself in that position, when you have that conversation with your wife about what if this happens, how am I going to respond? What should I do? And his advice and their agreement together was that our bodies belong to Christ and I will offer my body as a living sacrifice to Christ, even in that situation, even if that were to happen to me. Uh, so I, I agree with you. I don't think most of us can comprehend uh, sitting down with our wives and having that kind of conversation with her. Uh, but that's reality for people who are involved in church planting, people who are involved in evangelism inside Iran. Um, how can we be praying for the people in Iran? Um, I know you guys have a specific request going on. So uh, why don't you let people know so that they can be praying? Our audience loves to join in on these prayer requests uh, and and get that going. So why don't you let us know a little bit about what you have going there? Well, we can certainly pray for the ministry that's ongoing in Iran, the ministry reaching inside the country from outside, satellite television, internet ministries, and others. We can also pray for the protection of our brothers and sisters, protection from the authorities, uh, protection from the pandemic. Uh, but there's a request that, that I heard from an Iranian Christian that has really stuck with me, and it's a prayer request for those Christians who have been released from prison. And you think, well, wait a minute, they're released from prison. That's great news. But the reality is they're being watched. And so what often happens, and I think the natural thing you think, okay, I'm going to get out of prison. That's great. I'm going to go back with my church family. I'll be able to be with my Christian friends again. That is often, though, not the case because they're being watched so closely after they come out of prison. Many of the Christians naturally pull back from them from, for security reasons. Hey, we can't be spotted with you. We can't be seen with you because we know you're being watched. And so sometimes the Christians, even after they're released from prison, 
uh, they feel a sense of isolation and they feel a sense of discouragement. So I want to encourage people to pray for Christians who have been released from prison, who may be going through that sense of isolation. Just pray that God would encourage them and pray that they will be able to link back up with their church families inside Iran. All right, Todd Nettleton, Voice of the Martyrs, as always, thank you for joining us and uh, shedding some light on the plight of our brothers and sisters in Christ and other places of the world. You're welcome. Thanks for having me.